everybody. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about the uh, political philosophy of Hans Hoppe. Uh, as you will remember from my last lecture, I don't speak very loudly, so in case uh, you, you're not hearing what I'm saying, uh, please put up your hand and let me know. I hope people heard that, because <laughs> otherwise we're going to have a problem. Uh, this is the uh, first time I've lectured on uh, Hans Hoppe. I've spoken very briefly about him at a, another conference, and I've written reviews of a number of his books, but I've never given a lecture on him before. I, I hope it doesn't go too badly, because I wouldn't want to be physically removed from the Mises <laughs> Institute. <laughs> Uh, and what I want to do, I'll first uh, give a little background on, on Hans, who I, I say I've been friends with Hans for around 35 years, so I'm very glad to be able to talk about him. Uh, Hans was born in West Germany, and he did his graduate work at the Goethe University in Frankfurt. Now, this university was the, uh, founded in the Weimar Republic, and it's the, really the progressive university, as, opposed, as again, say, the older institutions. It was explicitly founded as a more progressive institution that was identified with, with the Weimar Republic, whereas in the 1920s, in many of the uh, older German universities, uh, the large parts of the faculty were unsympathetic to the Weimar Republic and hoped that it would be overthrown. And in fact, uh, Hans did his doctoral work with Jürgen Habermas, who's a leading member of the Frankfurt School this, uh, some of you may have heard of, of them. The uh, Frankfurt School was founded, the uh, Frankfurt, the Institute for Social Research, as it's given it its uh, formal name, was founded in the 1920s. And after it, uh, a few, a couple of initial directors, it, the director became Max Horkheimer, who was uh, a very influential person who uh, was, uh, led the school. And Theodore Adorno, the well-known uh, philosopher, was associated with him. And, uh, ha and uh, Habermas, who was Hans's teacher, had studied under both of them. Uh, so we have a, perhaps a bit of a paradox in that Hans Hoppe, who's a, a very strong libertarian, started out as a student of a Marxist. And I, I should say, just as a digression, there is a bit of a connection between the Institute of Social Research and Ludwig von Mises, surprising as it may seem. One of the early directors of the Institute for Social Research was Karl Grunberg, who had earlier been a professor at the University of Vienna. And Mises, as an undergraduate, was a student in uh, Grunberg's seminar. And his first academic publication, which was on uh, relations between lords and peasants in Galicia, uh, came up as a product of uh, Grunberg's seminar. It was published in 1902. So, there is, that is one connection of Mises with that institution. But in, to one point that when Hans studied with Habermas, although Habermas was a Marxist, uh, Hans's, I think, politics at that time were quite moderate, those of a conventional social democrat. And what he, 
got from Habermas was, uh, uh, which he retained, uh, it's retained throughout his career, was a, a criticism of positivism. The, uh, the Frankfurt School was very critical of the logical positivists in uh, Vienna Circle because particularly their assimilation of uh, the social sciences to physics and the natural sciences and also their uh, their re uh, claim that value judgments were purely subjective, that this the Frankfurt School repudiated, and uh, Hans has kept those uh, attitudes throughout his career. And in fact, uh, Hans's early, earliest publications when he studied with Habermas were in the field of philosophy of science. But while he was studying, uh, he became very interested in the free market ideas. And he read uh, Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard, and he became converted to their point of view. Uh, in fact, he was so impressed with Rothbard that he came to the United States to study with Murray Rothbard, and Rothbard thought very highly of him. Uh, I remember very well when Murray told me how excited he was that someone had come over from Germany, a very promising academic, and who was sitting in on his classes, and he was delighted that Hans was interested in his thought. And then in 1986, when Rothbard m moved to the UNLV, uh, at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, uh, uh, Hans Hoppe followed soon thereafter that uh, Murray really got him the job. And that, uh, they established really at, probably at the time, the most important center for the study of Austrian economics, that there were, uh, there were uh, both of them were there and they had uh, classes and seminars for a number of years until then after uh, uh, Murray's untimely death in, uh, nine, in 1990, beginning of 1995, uh, Hans continued as a professor for a few more years at the uh, UNLV, and then he retired, and he since moved to Turkey, where his he and his wife live, and he's continued writing, and he's established, he has an organization called the Property and Freedom Society, which holds uh, annual conferences. Uh, now... I would say uh, Hans Hoppe is the leading successor to Murray Rothbard in political philosophy, and he's, and he's made major contributions in a number of areas. And what I'm going to do in this talk is discuss three of these areas, uh, argumentation ethics, uh, the criticism of democracy, and the theory of social evolution. And one point I'd like to make before uh, attempting to do this is that, and this is one point I made at the, uh, when I was talking about during the Rothbard uh, graduate seminar, when I was talking about Mises, when we're dealing with any significant thinker, sometimes when we read him we'll be, inclined to criticize or think, oh, well, this doesn't sound right, or I don't agree with this. But I think it's important before we criticize a significant thinker to first understand what the person is saying. So what I'm going to be doing or trying to do in what follows is to give an exposition of what Hans is saying rather than try to come between 
Hans and you and try to give uh, critical points. I'm just going to be explaining as best I can what his views are. Now, uh, one of the, I think one of the most valuable uh, areas in which Hans has made a contribution is what he says is the starting point of political philosophy. Uh, he says that conflicts between people arise because of scarcity. Uh, imagine that all goods that people wanted were super abundant. Everyone could have as much of any good as he, as he wanted then there wouldn't be any occasions for conflicts. People could just have what they wanted. Wouldn't No one else would be disturbed by that. But we, of course, live in a world of scarcity, and people want to use the same resource. So in order to resolve conflicts about uh, the use of resources, we need rules that assign control of each resource to one person. So these rules, it doesn't have to be that, say, if you take all the resources that now exist, we don't have to have a rule that assigns each, each resource to each person. We could have rules for, say, there are some resources that are at present not owned by anybody, but we would have rules on how those resources can be appropriated. So this is a way to resolve. So again, Hans's view is we start off because we start, uh, political philosophy starts from conflict over resources, goods, and services, and we need to specify how these goods and services are owned so that we can uh, resolve conflicts. Now, to fully to understand Hans's thought here, we have to add another premise, which here uh, Hans follows Murray Rothbard, as he so frequently did, that according to Murray Rothbard, followed by Hans Hoppe, uh, all rights are property rights. For example, uh, supposing, say, we have a conflict over free speech. For Rothbard, the way to solve that conflict would be, say, whose property is it? If it's once you settle that, then that person would have the right to determine what the rules for proper speech, appropriate speech in his property are. So all rights are property rights. So if we add that all rights are property rights to the point that we have uh, disp disputes over resources to be settled by assigning the property rights to people, then we have, in principle, a way of solving all conflicts in society, since all rights are property rights, and we've specified the property rights, so that enables, uh, enables us to resolve all disputes. So now we have, uh, we have to get some way of assigning the property rights. How is that to be done? And here we get to perhaps the most famous of Hans's contributions, argumentation ethics. Uh, and here Hans developed argumentation ethics from the work of his teacher, Jürgen Habermas, and another philosopher, uh, Karl Otto Oppel. Actually, he was more influenced by Oppel. Oppel wasn't very interested in politics. I think he was uh, he had was a social democrat, but he was more of a pure philosopher in 
uh, Hans has an extremely high opinion of Apple, and he's uh, he cites him in uh, in various of his works. So, what the way argumentation ethics proceeds is that if you make a claim to truth, if I say something is true, uh, and say someone questions that and says, "Well," what is the basis for that, that the claim that I've made that something is true has to be supported by argument. Uh, any truth claim has to be supported by argument. And Hans says, so this can't be denied if someone says, no, it doesn't have to be supported by argument. Hans says, no, that's wrong. Hans says, you can't argue that you can't argue well, I'm not going to argue about it then. Uh, so what the uh, Habermas and Apel said, and followed by Hans Hoppe, is, Han so we then have to say, uh, in order to engage in argument, we then have to ask, what are the conditions under which we can engage in argument? This is something both Habermas and Apple ask. They say, what are the conditions for rational discussion? If we have people who are trying to establish the truth. What are the conditions for rational discussion? And, and on that basis, I'm trying to find out what the conditions are for rational discussion, then they get rights from that. So you can see one criticism sometimes people make of argumentation ethics we can see isn't right. Some people will say, well, supposing we establish, say that uh, certain conditions are needed for rational discussion, that would just show people have those rights during the rational discussion, but that doesn't show they have rights outside that process of discussion. But that isn't a good criticism, because remember, the way the argument goes is that the conditions for rational discussion establish what the rights people have are. It isn't that the rights that, you, that you're trying to figure out what you're limiting the rights people have to actual instances of rational discussion. It's trying to figure out what these rights are required, are required for rational discussion is gives you the rights that people have if the theory is correct. So the innovation Hans has in uh, argumentation ethics that Habermas and Apel didn't have is that he answers the question of what rights people have in a different way from Habermas and Apel. So uh, the key step is that Hans says, in order to argue, you must own yourself, uh, taking that in the libertarian way, each person is a self-owner. And to deny this is what he calls a performative or pragmatic contradiction. In order to understand uh, what this means, I want to say a bit about what we mean by a performative contradiction. Now, there are some, uh, sometimes we have statements that are logically contradictory, say someone says, uh, uh, I'm both lecturing in this room, and it's not the case that I'm lecturing in this room. That would be a logical contradiction. But we can have other sorts of, besides logical contradictions, there are other sorts of difficulties that we can have with various assertions or propositions or judgments. One is that, and the one that Hans is concerned with here, is what's this something that uh, 
if I say something, my very saying that shows that the statement is false. Uh, suppose I say, uh, I've never, I suppose I say in English, I've never in my life uttered an English sentence. My saying that would show I, I wouldn't be able to make, I say that I've never uttered an English sentence. Uh, I would, my saying that I'm saying that in English, I wouldn't be able to say that in English without speaking an English sentence. So my very saying that shows that the statement is false. So this is a, a very good way of showing that something is wrong to show that it's, uh, it falls uh, victim to this sort of pragmatic contradiction. Now, there are many interesting issues one could talk about on the scope and limits of this kind of performative contradiction, but we can, it's, we can see examples uh, of similar type. It's some, suppose somebody said, uh, uh, I know that no one knows anything. Well, if it's true that no one knows anything, then the person doesn't know that. So his, his saying, I know that I, no one knows anything is, will generate trouble to say the least. So uh, Hans says that, suppose someone said, I don't own myself. Someone denies that each person owns himself, so he says, I don't own myself. So he, he could only say that if he did own himself. So this is an example of a performative contradiction, and Hans says this shows that people do own themselves. But he says, this is continuing his innovation in the... Uh, what uh, in the argumentation ethics of Habermas and Apple, he says, owning yourself isn't enough to engage in argument. Uh, you also have to own physical resources because you, you wouldn't be able to argue if you didn't, if you just were a kind of a body with no place to stand. You have to have physical resources. So then this raises the question, how are these resources to be acquired? And he says that only a first user rule can avoid conflict. Uh, that's to say the first one to use a resource, is, a resource acquires it. Because if, say, you had another rule, say, say I acquired something, I uh, say I take an apple from a tree. So if that doesn't give me ownership, someone else could come along and say, no, I want that apple, and then there'd be a conflict, there'd be a fight about it, which I'd be likely to lose. Uh, but so only a uh, first user's rule can avert conflict. And Hans also has a further argument for this uh, first user rule. He says that there, if we want a rule of property acquisition, then we have, uh, there are only two ways, two possibilities. One is this first user rule or that we appropriate something by just the fir first one to use it, or the other alternative is that you could own something by, just by claiming it. You could just say, I own this, this is mine, without using it. But he, he says, well, if we had that rule, then you could acquire people just by 
claiming to own them, and this wouldn't would be in conflict with the uh, with the self ownership principle, which remember is one that uh, generates a pragmatic contradiction if it's denied. So he says that only this first user rule is the one that will uh, be uh, acceptable and will avoid conflict and will be we can be shown to be a consequence of the uh, self-ownership principle. And one point Hans makes uh, in his consideration of ethics, and this would reply to an objection, suppose you say, well, maybe this establishes that each person owns himself, but what about other people? Uh, maybe I own myself, but why do I have to recognize that you own yourself? Uh, well, one answer would be, remember, we're trying to engage in, uh, figure out what are the conditions for rational discussion, and we wouldn't be able to have a rational discussion if, unless each person owned himself. So, in Hans's view, and here he's quite in accord with standard views in ethics, uh, ethical principles have to be universal. Uh, uh, so now I want to go on to the second theme of uh, that I want to talk about, which is Hans's criticism of democracy. Uh, now, it seems, at least to many people, that democracy is obviously a good thing. It, people who have this view would say, well, isn't it better that people rule themselves rather than be subjects in a dictatorship? Uh, say, we wouldn't like to live in countries where there is this, say, people don't have a right to vote and there's a single ruler who is in charge of everything, this would seem at least very undesirable state of affairs. And uh, even if we don't have a dictatorship, isn't it better to decide conflicts by accepting who wins in a fair election. Of course, as we see in the recent presidential election, what's a fair election can be a matter of quite a bit of dispute. And there are criticisms what could make from within the perspective of democracy of rule by majority, for, say, of its sort raised by... Uh, 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 James Buchanan and Gordon Tullock, that, for, in, uh, for example, there are various ways of considering what is a, a majority. Is it a straight majority, or do you require more than a, a majority? Or There are various r voting rules that will generate different results. So it's not clear what rule by majority really means. But Hans's objection to uh, democracy is a deeper one than the uh, criticisms, say, from the public, public choice squad. Hans rejects these pro-democracy arguments. He does this in a book with the title Democracy, the God That Failed. Now, this book uh, comes from a famous collection of essays that was published in 1949, edited by the British socialist R.H.S. Crossman. And in this collection, there were a number of writers who were either uh, former members of the Communist Party or sympathizers. Uh, some of them were, I think there was Arthur Kessler was one, uh, uh, Louis Fisher was a Stephen Spender, uh, 
Andre Gide and Ignacio Silone were contributors to this, and they, it was a very well-known book during the Cold War. So what Hans is entitling his book, Democracy, the God that Failed, is suggesting that just as we recognize today that communism was a false god, even though at the time in the 1930s and 40s, there were many people in the West who took it quite seriously. Uh, Hans is suggesting that democracy is a god, false god, just like communism. Uh, now, his fundamental objection to democracy is one that we can see already uh, from what has gone before, that democracy, it, 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 the objection is that democracy ignores rights. In what sense does it do that? Well, if people have rights in the way Hans Hoppe has argued for, remember he said all people have property rights and each person has property rights. He owns himself and then can acquire resources, all rights or property rights, and then we have rules for how resources can be acquired. So there's no further room for disputes. We have the way to resolve disputes. So anyone who interferes with your property rights is guilty of aggression including majority voters. So even if the majority in a, say we stipulate that there has been a free election, there's no uh, disputes about the, how the votes are to be counted, say a majority votes that there's going, should be taxes on wealthy people, that's still aggression because it's interfering with people's rights. So the majority can't tell you how to use your property. So that's his basic criticism of democracy. Uh, now he goes further that this point I've made, it can be the anti-democracy argument that democracy... Uh, interferes with your rights can be used to support anarchism, libertarian anarchism, anarcho-capitalism. His argument here is that one right that stems from self-ownership <clears throat> is your right to self-defense. And he says that supposing someone, as some libertarians do, such as uh, Robert Nozick, in his famous book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, 1974, argues for a minimal state, which is very minimal. It's just supposed to protect rights, and it doesn't have the power of taxation. But Hans says, well, if people surrender their rights to the, to the state, even a very limited state, then there's really no stopping at the right to defend themselves to the, the minimal state, say they've surrendered all their weapons to the state, then there's really no stopping the state. The state can really do anything. So if once you've given up your rights, your arms to the state, then the state can just do whatever it wants. So the notion of, of a minimal state in which people surrender their rights to, the, to defend themselves to the state is one that's inherently unstable. Uh, now, you can see here a major difference between Hans Hoppe and Ludwig von Mises. Uh, Hans, as I mentioned, was greatly influenced by Mises, but here there's 
an important distinction. Mises had a very different view of democracy from Hans Hoppe. And according to Mises, the advantage, uh, one of the main advantages of a free market is that it's more democratic than political democracy. Say in a political democracy, you're voting for a, a party, a particular party or person, and then that person will have a certain platform. Or, and even if the one you voted for wins, he's probably not going to put into effect all the policies you want, and then the losers really don't get what they want at all. But in the free market, according to Mises, the consumers are really running things. Uh, what he, call, he calls the producers, the, uh, the mandatories uh, of the, I mean, the, the producers, the mandatory of the consumers, the consumers are really in control, as he often says. Uh, capitalism is mass production for the masses. So according to Mises, the property owners, at least the owners of the means of production, really are just not the real owners, at least that it's really the consumers are in control. So you can see it's a very different view of democracy from Hans Hoppe's radical rejection of the whole idea. Uh, now, Hans makes a very well an argument that's attracted a great deal of attention is that he says democratic politicians need to get majority support to gain power and stay in office. So what counts for them is what will get people to support them now. And they'll make promises that can't be fulfilled because the long run doesn't matter to them once people find out that, uh, by the time people find out that not all the promises can be fulfilled, they're probably, they, they'll be out of office anyway, so it really doesn't matter. What counts is that they just want to get elected now. And by contrast, uh, monarchies tend to adopt a long-run perspective. Uh, the king, say a king expects his family will be around for a long time, so he'll try to run his state in an economically efficient way. So uh, I've given so far the discussion of argumentation ethics and Hans's criticism of democracy, and he uses the two parts of his views that I've discussed so far to develop a theory of social evolution, especially social evolution as applied to uh, European history. So in doing this, he's engaging in, a, I think, a very significant project, what one could call conjectural history. That's to say, he's using social theory to account, uh, kind of offer a rational reconstruction of history. And we could give exa an example of this that you will have heard about in various lectures earlier, is the way that the origin of money was explained by Karl Menger and Ludwig von Mises, how money originates from a commodity that has non-monetary uses. So what Menger and Mises were doing is on the basis of theory, they were showing how one could rationally account for uh, the origin of money. So what Hans is doing is trying to uh, come up with a rational reconstruction of history. 
Uh, now, the usual account of European history is emphasizes progress. Uh, history started, say, in a kind of primitive times with a war of all against all people. Say, you can imagine primitive tribes were fighting with each other, but absolute rule put an end to this. And then eventually this was replaced by democracy. So in the usual view, which uh, I think even today most historians hold, there's been a progress throughout European history from uh, the kind of a struggle which was continue of conflicting forces continued under feudalism, then was replaced by absolutism, and then we get democracy after that. So uh, Hans rejects this entire myth, what he calls a myth of progress. He acknowledges, though, that there was a, there's been progress and there's been an economic takeoff after the Industrial Revolution, but he rejects this notion of uh, a hist a historical progress. So what he, his contention is, he denies that history started off as a war of all against all. He says, this is a falsehood defended by pro-state intellectuals. And instead, in, say, initial state, people would naturally accept the self-ownership and first appropriator accounts of rights, that the, these aren't made-up theories, ones that, uh, say, people such as Hans Hoppe or Murray Rothbard have come up with. These are actually the rules that people would, in practice, adopt. So in settling disputes on these principles, people would tend to gravitate to natural leaders or aristocrats, and feudalism developed from this. But over time, one aristocrat would tend to become stronger than others and become the king, but the king's power was strictly limited by other nobles. But as uh, feudalism developed and came to an end, the king undermined the other nobles by allying with the people, and he promised them relief from their feudal duties if he would, the, the people would support him. And in doing this, he was helped by court intellectuals, which uh, phrase uh, Hans takes over from Murray Rothbard and also Harry Elmer Barnes, and the court intellectuals wanted to gain power and influence, so they defended absolute monarchy by the myth of the need for a monarchy to rescue people from the war of all against all. But after the absolute monarchy developed, the court intellectuals thought they could gain even more power by abandoning the monarch and appealing to the people through pro-democracy arguments, and this is what happened during the French Revolution. I think here Hans is relying on accounts of the influence of the intellectual says we find in the book by Augustin Cochin on the societies of thought before the French Revolution, or the books by the British historian uh, Nesta Webster. So I've covered only a few main themes in Hans Hoppe's political philosophy, but I hope I've shown how central his account of rights in his, is in his thinking. So thank you very much.